Hello, Jordan, and welcome everyone to the Books to Last podcast. How are you doing today, Jordan? Uh, I'm doing really good, thank you. Uh, got a busy day today, but uh, trying to take it easy in the morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm also fine, thank you. I actually just came back from a walk where I went to like, you know, the bank, the post box where we put the thank you cards for our wedding like the last ones are sent out so officially this big project of 2021 came to a close with the send out of these thank you cards so yeah feeling feeling pretty good and very excited to do our collaboration together so yeah dear listeners now that you've heard a little bit of how we are doing of course you're very interested on what we are going to cover in this episode as you may know the books to last podcast is the podcast is the podcast that challenges book lovers to pick the only five books they can take with them when they are cast away to an isolate remote location. However, as this is a special Christmas episode, we are doing something that is a little bit different from the usual concept. So in this episode, Jordan is going to be the one sharing the list of her books, as you might have heard it's a totally different voice that is speaking right now let me quickly introduce myself i'm marike from the child of the library podcast and i've been on jordan's podcast before so uh, some of you might have already heard my voice and yeah i'm very very happy to be here today to be like the host and sort of taking over this episode and guide jordan through her five books that she wants to pick however Today, she's not going to pick a list of five books that she will take to a remote location, but something a little different. So, Jordan, why don't you tell us about what list you are going to create for us today? Yes. So, I did consider sharing my castaway list, but I think I wanted to save it for a little bit further down the line. Um, I think because I'm too chicken and I think I'm not ready to make that choice yet so we'll uh, we'll <laughs> I've ducked out of it <laughs> but uh, some listeners might know um, from sort of past episodes or from even knowing me uh, or talking to me that I'm actually expecting a baby very soon and since it's nearly Christmas and I wanted to do something a bit different I thought it might be nice to look at my books and reading and share a list of books that I would really want to read with my son who we are expecting just a couple days before Christmas <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and yeah because reading was a really big part of my childhood it's really something that I'd like to share with my children in the future and uh, yeah I wanted to talk about some of my favorite stories and yeah I've had so much fun talking about books with you before Marika. it's just it's always a blast so I thought you'd be a great person to chat with it about and yeah I'm really looking forward to it it was it was quite difficult actually I ended up with quite a long list <laughs> <laughs> oh my god thank you so much for having me this is so exciting and again now in person of course congratulations I really look forward to hear your experience with like the new little one on the way etc so congrats congratulations on this one but Let's dive into the list, shall we? Because I'm also super excited to know what books you have picked. So what is the first one that you would read with your little one? Okay, so the first one was, it's like, it's a book that I, it's the earliest book I remember reading. Um, I think I was probably maybe four the first time I heard it. My um, nan used to read it to me and my brother when we were younger. And it's called The Giraffe and the Pelly and Me. Uh, by Roald Dahl. Um, it's not a Roald Dahl book that I think as many people are familiar with. I know a lot of people have heard of his sort of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and uh, James and the Giant Peach and, and some of his other more popular ones. But um, we had, and I've got, I've actually got the original one in front of me. It is very old and tattered and just covered in marks and all sorts because it is probably nearly as old as I am <laughs> but um, I still have the original one that my nan read to me and I just remember loving it so much my nan tells me about how me and my brother would, would always be picking this one book up and she must have read it to us a million times because it was the only one we ever wanted to hear um, 
for anybody who's not familiar with the draft, uh, the draft and the Pelly and me, um, it is about a little boy who goes to help work for the Ladderless Window Cleaning Company uh, because the giraffe, the Pelly, and there is also a monkey involved, but he doesn't get to make it into the title. Um, <laughs> oh, no, <poor> monkey. <laughs> but he's on the front, and they are the Ladderless Window Cleaning Company. The giraffe is the ladder, technically. He's, the, he's what they climb up. The monkey cleans the windows, and the Pelly holds all of the water in his beak. But uh, they're kind of magical creatures because the giraffe's neck grows however long it needs to be to reach the window. The pelican's beak gets as big as it needs to be to have all of the water. And I just remember the illustrations being really fun. And they go on all sorts of adventures before eventually opening a sweet shop during which Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory actually gets a little reference, a cameo in it. No! (laughs) Oh! Um, yeah, and I just love it. It's um, one, and I think the one thing that sort of always stood out to me, and it's a quote that still sort of sticks in my head now, even all these years, because I've not read it in a really long time, although I was flicking through it um, this morning because I was thinking about it. Um, and the ve- it, there's, it's mainly written in prose, but every now and then it goes into a rhyme, um, as Roald Dahl sometimes does. And um, as it, the story's wrapping up the way it ends is um we have tears in our eyes as we say our goodbyes we so loved being with you we three so do please now and then come and see us again the giraffe the pelly and me all you do is to look at at a page in this well all you do is to look at a page in this book because that's where we'll always be no book ever ends when it's full of your friends the giraffe the pelly and me and i just it just that yeah, it's the no book ever ends when it's full of your friends that always stuck like stuck in my head. So that I felt like it had to be in there. Although I feel like I'm going to have to get a more sturdy copy <laughs> <laughs> because this one is definitely on its last legs. <laughs> <laughs> but that's such a lovely quote, and can I can totally understand why you picked it. Like maybe a little information for everyone who has not been or has not listened to the episode where I was on before. I'm actually from Germany, so probably there's not too much crossover of the books that we have read in our childhoods. So it is always very interesting for me also to hear all of those English children's stories, because to be honest, by now they are probably translated into German. But, you know, back then when I was a child, this was not the case (laughs) or just for like the real, real, real classics that were like written like so long ago. So, yeah, I'm always very excited. And that sounds like such a such a cute story. (laughs) It's yeah. And it's so strange because it's like one of the only Roald Dahl books I've, I've read because I never really got into him as a when as a young child. And it's so strange. It's just like you say, with different um, countries. I know. I mean, Roald Dahl to. I suppose the UK is kind of more like sort of, I know Dr. Seuss is, was very big for uh, kids and young people in um, America. And we, we never really had Dr. Seuss over here because I guess, I don't know. I mean, or at least not that I came into contact with. It just wasn't as um, widely exported, I suppose. And so Roald Dahl and, you know, Quentin Blake's illustrations are kind of iconic with young people's reading in this country which has I mean he's I I I can't remember I think Roald Dahl has some um because of his age and the time period with which he was writing in he's had controversy I believe a little bit around a lot of his stories but um yeah I always just have really fond memories of this one quite strange actually because my um my sister-in-law is um, a, a year or two older than me. And she has a similar copy, very similar to this one, because it was her favorite when she was younger. And I found it really, really nice because usually when I tell people about it, they say, oh, I've never heard of that one. They've heard of Roald Dahl, but they've never heard of this particular story because it's always usually Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or the Witches or one of those other ones. But yes, <laughs> um, but that was my first one because, yeah, it's just, I always whenever I see this book as well I just remember sitting in this very distinctive 
bedroom at my nan's house and I can <laughs> see her reading it to me and my very small brother. Um, and yeah, it's just really, really, yeah, strange. And it's lovely and yellow and I love the illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> so that's also a bonus. <laughs> illustrations are always great. Yeah. And I love children's books for those because they always take so much care of really making them really cute. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so good when, they, when they're showing you the different sort of um, like magic tricks that the animals can do because they sort of illustrate with arrows and all sorts what, what it is that they do. And it's, yeah, they, I think they clean windows at Buckingham Palace and all sorts. It's just, it's just such a... I, it's actually so much longer a story than I remember it being looking back on it now. I remember it being shorter, I think, but it's really, yeah, it's a lot longer than I remember and it's just great. But yeah, it's, just... it's also fun that they have like, you know, such a grown up job because cleaning windows is probably not like a child's hobby or when you ask a child, yeah, what do you want to become in the future? They like, there are probably maybe some, but not many will say, yeah, I want to clean windows all day. <laughs> So yeah. it's really funny that you made that choice. Exactly. It's it's it is a <laughs> it's definitely an interesting one. It's I, I always do wonder that with some jobs, I suppose. Um I'm a surveyor by trade and whenever someone asks how you get into surveying, absolutely no one says, Oh, I've wanted to be a surveyor since I was five years old and it's all I've ever wanted to do. It's um it's just not one of those jobs. It's a job that people usually found by accident afterwards. <laughs> but um yeah, I just I yeah, I always find it really interesting where you've got the, the jobs that everyone wants to do from when they're very young and then the jobs that people find when they get older is always quite funny as well. <laughs> But yes, that's my first choice, The Giraffe and the Pally and Me. And I would recommend literally everyone read it because <laughs> it's just fun and it's short. <laughs> that's such a great recommendation. So what is your second book that you would pick? Okay, so this is a another book that I remember reading when I was quite young um, with school this time. Mm -hmm. um I don't have a, I I could have sworn I had a copy but I feel like I must have lent it to someone because it's not on my shelf and I was very sad um because it's got a gorgeous gorgeous cover as well <laughs> um but it's uh Kenzuki's Kingdom by Michael Morpurgo so mm -hmm. Michael Morpurgo is slightly more famous for um War Horse Uh, is one of his, and um, I want to say, is Saving Private Ryan one of his as well? Um, I feel like it is. <laughs> He's oh. Def definitely War Horse Ma is Michael Morpurgo, probably not Saving Private Ryan, I don't know where that's come from. But Michael Morpurgo is, again, he's probably quite, he's quite famous, at least in the UK, as a, as a, an author of mainly children's books um there is another one that's very famous that's escaping me now but Kanzuki's Kingdom was the first one that I read of his and um it is about a little boy who um <laughs> he lives with his mum and dad he's an only child he's got a dog called Stella Artois which is a beer um which was always very amusing to it yeah it's 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 a beer in the UK <laughs> <laughs> um and it, it's not from the UK I'm pretty sure with a name like Stella Artois it's probably from somewhere else <laughs> but um it's 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 widely drunk here and their dog is named after it and um he uh his parents are going through a difficult time at the moment he's quite young so he's you get his perspective as a child of what is going on um, but essentially his job, his, his father loses his job. I think he gets laid off. Um, his parents are in sort of financial difficulty because of it. And, um, the little boy has, he has like a paper round and one day, um, he goes out for his paper round, um, just to go and deliver newspapers. And when he comes back, um, his mom is very upset because his dad is, apparently gone out and sold the house instead and he's bought a he's bought a boat and as a wife she is very frustrated by this impulsive thing that it, her husband's done um which I 
kind of understand more now as an adult because I think if my if my husband went out and just sold our house and bought a boat without consulting me I imagine I would probably be quite unhappy um yeah <laughs> but um at the time it's like you don't really get her perspective of it um and the little boy's really confused because he's like, well, why Why has he done that? And they said, well, because his dad still hadn't been able to get a job at this point. And apparently he'd been getting very increasingly frustrated. And the last straw was his son going out to his paper round, which he gets paid a very small amount of money for. And sort of realizing that the only source of income that the house had was this little boy's paper round that was the only money that was coming into the house apparently that was the last straw um so we went out on board a boat <laughs> um because they were going to go and sail away from their problems and they were going to go and explore so she should get some kind of award for being a very understanding wife because she agrees to it and they pull their son out of school and then they get on this boat and they go on an adventure um crazy but, yeah yeah uh, but pretty early on it goes quite wrong um someone has to stay out to I can't remember how young this child is but someone has to stay out to watch the boat at night and uh the boy is filling out a, a little log because he's got a diary that he fills out you know the different things that he does every day on the boat and uh there's a storm one night when he's watching the boat and he gets thrown overboard and because it's the middle of the night his parents are asleep so they don't no Mm. and he has uh he manages to grab something and just sort of float there um and he's stuck out at sea for quite a long time um until eventually he's washed out washed up on this deserted island somewhere and um he it's actually it's quite harrowing really when I think back on it because they do actually describe quite a long time what it's like for him to just be yet yeah, stuck in the middle of the sea not sure what's going to happen to him um and but he washes up on this island where he is saved and looked after by a very old um Japanese man called Kenzuki uh-huh. and um you kind of I don't want to give any sort of spoilers away, but um, Hinzuki's got reasons for why he's on this island on his own um, and how he's figured out how to survive there. And he and they just sort of live together and learn from each other a lot. And I'm not going to go any further than that because there's 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 a lot of bits where considering it's quite a tame story, that's all happens at the beginning. Um and then the main the main plot happens on this island, but um, it's just really it's a really interesting, really touching book. I remember really enjoying it when I was younger, and it's got this gorgeous sort of cover with um, red sky and like waves because they're showing the moment with the boat, and it's just I, I just remember it being a really lovely story. Um, that I enjoyed reading quite young and it's it's funny because it's not the kind of book I would read now I, in a million years I don't think I've picked up a single Michael Morpurgo book since this one <laughs> um, but yeah it's uh, it, it's another one that made an impression on me and it's it's something that I wanted to share with I suppose my kids because I felt like there was a lot of really important lessons about mm-hmm. compassion and understanding and a, a lot of other thing a lot of other sort of grown up emotions but put through quite a innocent lens with Kenzuki's kingdom so yeah i really really enjoyed it it's um yeah and some fascinating sort of commentary on race and racism <laughs> also so i when i think back on it it's actually it's put, it's lifting a lot of weight for a um <laughs> for a children's book which which was the other reason why i found this list really difficult because obviously i um I'm not a child anymore and even though I do still read middle grade books every now and then um trying to think of books because I was thinking very specifically for different ages and I have got some that are intended to be read when that that I would probably um recommend my child read when they're a bit older than you know very small but (laughs) or something to read with them at least um this was this is yeah very much 
aimed, aimed at that age. So yeah, I thought it was interesting. <laughs> this, this was actually also a question that I had, whether this book, because compared to the first one, it's obviously like, you know, it has much heavier topics. And also when you say that for such a long time, they are talking about how it is like for the child to be drowning. I can, I can imagine like when you read this with your child, when they are too young, this is something that they could get quite scared by. So is this more like a middle grade book that kids could potentially also read on their own or is it for another age age I range? Th I think you can read it on your own. It's oh, grades three to eight. I don't know what that means now because I don't know what ages they are. I So I read it when I was in primary school. So I would have been eight okay. or nine years old um, because I read it in year six with the rest of my class. So I would have been, yeah, eight or nine. Um, and it wasn't too heavy for that age group I suppose if you've got quite a mature seven-year-old I suppose you could read it with a little bit younger than that I think I was actually speaking to a previous guest about that recently with ages and books because um she was saying that sort of as uh, a librarian and uh, you know when you if you work in a bookstore and that sort of thing you kind of get to know that even though there are broad umbrellas for ages um each child is very individual I I'm often told that my younger brother who is six is reading very high above his I suppose re level in terms of the um actual physical reading element but mm -hmm. content is obviously a slightly different mm. um discussion uh so when I went to the bookstore because I wanted to I always buy all the kids in my family they get books for Christmas off me whether they want them or not um <laughs> my my general ruling is if they've got the books then at least there's something for them to read if they eventually you know all of their games consoles run out of battery and they <laughs> and there's no internet or something and they have to pick something up if they've got the books there then they're there um it doesn't help that they're all boys as well <laughs> um And that was a big part of, I think a big part of why I wanted to do this list as well, because I, I know I read a study years ago and I think it's still very much the case now that um, generally in younger ages, boys and girls tend to read about equally. It's about a 50-50 split. And then up to a certain age, I think it's around about the time they go into secondary school and higher education, um, there is a huge drop off in reading in young boys. And there's a drop in uh, with girls as well, just not as significant. And uh, it's always like very difficult because there's obviously there's always books that are like marketed by publishers like, oh, these are books that boys will read. <laughs> um, and even though it really pains me to think that, you know, there's like such a gender bias within reading, <laughs> um, I do constantly find myself like scouring bookshops and uh, book recommendations on the internet and trying to think, trying to find books specifically that would appeal to the young boys in my life, my cousins, my uh, nieces and, and my, my, my nephews and that sort of thing, because reading is so fun. And there's a, <laughs> there's a proven correlation between if you read more, you enjoy it more. Um, and I just think it's such a shame that it's something that's so like wholly marketed away from boys after a certain age. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna try and make a concerted effort to not. <laughs> If you lay the groundwork in strongly enough with young kids, then it's. I suppose it sticks. I've got some nieces and nephews who absolutely love reading so much now, even very, very young. Um, they do say there are studies that say that, you know, boys do tend to come back to it as they get older. Um, it's just the sort of teenage years <laughs> that seem to be really difficult. <laughs> But yes, I, I can imagine like before, like everything happened in 2020, in 2019, when I was still like taking a lot of trains to work, there was always this train that went to the nearest city here where a lot of school kids went. But of course, like not when they're in primary school, but when they are in secondary school and actually, you know, can be trusted to take a train <laughs> to wherever they need to go to school. And I remember most of them like sat together and either one of them had I don't know a Nintendo Switch or any other like portable console or their mobile phones and they were playing games on those devices and then there was this one boy who, who was not like 
like he had other like two other boys around him and they were collectively reading from that one hard copy of Percy Jackson and I was like yes this is what I want to see oh that is like the happiest picture anyone could give me ever I'm gonna just like that that's that's going into the <laughs> that's so that makes me so happy um, <laughs> yeah I um I always like I, I mean those those parents are brave letting their children take Nintendo Switches into school on the train. I mean, that's just yeah. I mean, I don't know whether it's me and my brother, but we used to lose things. They got broken. It's just like you did they didn't leave the house. <laughs> um yeah. Uh, I do find it it's, yeah, I've listened to a lot of I've listened to an a uh, strange interview with the supposedly the strictest headmistress in all of the UK on the news recently and she was talking about phones and when children should be allowed phones and tablets and that sort of thing you can imagine her opinions were probably quite controversial um (laughs) (laughs) but um i and the thing is i'm probably a huge hypocrite because i spend time on my phone i spend a lot of time on my phone i spend a lot of time on my computer i you know spend a lot of time on technology it's not as if i'm you know living a very digital detox life (laughs) um but it's it is i suppose a shame in a way how it's completely replaced that in parts of my life i actually went to a a pub yesterday that had uh when you got there and you were let in by the, the the kind bouncer man he said can I ask you not to use your phones inside the pub? And me and my husband, when we we got to the door, I went to him, I was like, did he ask us not to use our phones inside of the pub? And he said, and he was like, yeah, that is a bit of a weird, we'd never been requested that before. And when we got in, there were signs up that said that they were a digital detox pub. They encouraged conversation. Um, and you were told, you basically you weren't supposed to be on your phone, answering your phone, just generally ignoring each other for your phone whilst in this pub otherwise you would be asked to leave there was also a zero tolerance policy on swearing <laughs> it's it's a very individual pub i can't imagine uh, many people do this but i actually really enjoyed it and when i went in i was like they weren't massively enforcing it i saw a few people who were on their phone in there they weren't asked to leave or or anything um but when i went in and i saw all these signs i'm a bit of i'm I don't know. I don't know whether it's a British thing or a me thing, but I just, when I saw signs, I was like, well, I'm not allowed to do it, so I'm not going to. <laughs> um, and I, it was actually kind of really, it was really nice. We I, we were with my in-laws who, funnily enough, um, <laughs> funnily enough, they were the only two who actually went on the phone. Me and my husband were uh, more than capable of getting through the 45 minutes we were in this pub without being on our phone. They were not. <laughs> um, considering we're the the young people with (laughs) with the yeah the addiction to our phones but um uh although in all fairness they were for like you know essential text messages and that sort of thing I don't know Uh, okay but (laughs) of course obviously but um yeah it was just it was a really interesting experience although it was also interesting how many times we were talking about a trip we were going to do and how many times we both we all reached to go for our phone because we wanted to check something like train times or how much a flight would cost. And we were, had to stop ourselves and go, oh, it's really difficult to make these decisions and conversations without our phones to give us the information we need. <laughs> but yes, I yeah hope to encourage reading. I, to be fair, our little nephew, who is too soon, he loves books he's constantly like he will go up to the bookshelf he will pick up a book he'll bring it up to you and he'll give it to you and then sit on your lap and and have you read it to him and and then once you've finished he will literally flip you back to the front first page and make you read it to him again (laughs) Um, yeah he so he loves it so um you know there's hope yet those those three young boys reading Percy Jackson on a train in Germany, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my my nephew demanding that we reread the same book six times in a row <laughs> to him. There is hope. <laughs> oh yeah, Th- those are wonderful pictures in our heads. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the third one that you would like to have our listeners to have on their list of things that you could potentially read with your children? Well, this, uh, funnily you should mention Percy Jackson because this was the absolute first book that popped into my head that I knew immediately was going to be on the list. I I just knew it was because I, 
So Percy Jackson was the book series that made me really love reading. It was the first book series I binged, like truly just start to finish. Can't differentiate between the first five books because I read them all so quickly. Um, (laughs) And I saved up all of my pocket money to go and buy the book set. And I just love the series so much. And it's very important to me that I share that because it's just amazing. I'm currently, um, this is the second Christmas, I'm buying the second book for my um youngest cousin for his uh present because I bought him the first one last year because I really wanted him to read it and he said oh I really want to read these so he had that last year he's getting the second one this year I may end up getting the third one for his birthday so he doesn't have to wait as long (laughs) um but yeah I and specifically I have the lightning Harry uh Percy Jackson the lightning thief not not that one not the other one um (laughs) Percy Jackson the lightning thief and I have the illustrated edition Oh, that's so cool. Like when I saw that they do them for Percy Jackson too, and not only for Harry Potter, I really thought about, you know, it was like, oh, Jordan is going to love this. Yeah. So they've only done the first one because the, the rest of the books haven't been commissioned for illustrated copies. I'm hoping because Disney are doing the TV show and they like to have lots of merch to go with their TV shows that they are going to get the wonderful John Rocco who (laughs) illustrated this to work with Rick and publish the next four books in illustrated version. They have done all of the Percy Jackson's as graphic novels actually because Rick is big advocate for getting young boys into reading i mean all people into reading but specifically young boys because he knows it's a there's an agenda gap in literacy and that sort of thing for um young boys and graphic novels comic books they all tend to they tend to market better with boys um as a gateway into reading so he's got most all of his books have been converted into graphic novels so you can get the percy jacksons in graphic novels but this illustrated version is the full book with full color illustrations and it's really wonderful. I reread it recently. It's specifically this version because um, I'm listening to the newest Olympian podcast Mm. um, who is reading them from beginning to end for the first time. Um, So I've been reading along with him so that I can listen to his episodes and have it fresh in my mind. And it's also a good excuse to just reread it. Uh, And yeah, and the illustrated copy is just gorgeous and amazing. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Percy Jackson and the Olympians is a, I would probably say middle grade, not young adult, no. middle grade series um, for uh, about Percy Jackson, who is a demigod um, with really awesome powers. And he essentially goes on quests um, on at the behest of the gods for the first five books. And then there's a bunch of other spin-off series um, in the off chance that you don't know <laughs> anything about Percy Jackson, that's probably all I'm going to say, just because it is really nice to discover it all from the beginning. It is it is a series that is often contrasted and compared to Harry Potter because it is set up in a very similar way. Um, I would argue it is maybe more educational <laughs> than harry potter and it also does not get as dark as harry potter (laughs) so you can yeah you can read the five percy jackson books at quite a young age and it will not be as uh, probably problematic towards the end (laughs) as if you read all seven harry potter books because i do think they get very dark and they get into some very iffy territory and i'm not saying that there's nothing problematic in percy jackson because that's one of the things the podcast is discussing um mike schubert who's doing the newest olympian they are sort of picking up on a few things although bear in mind this was written in the early 2000s um and it is very much you know it still has some content in it that was considered acceptable in early 2000s but has maybe moved on since then But it's still got so much value. It still holds up really well. It still actually has aged very well, even considering the few bits as well. And Percy's just an amazing main character who I think is a good role model, especially for young boys, because he's actually very emotionally intelligent. And um, he's very, he's just a very good, decent, kind character, but not in a really... 
ostentatious way I suppose it's like small acts of kindness of not pushing people when they don't seem to want to be pushed and kind of knowing when to mind his own business and knowing when to be there for someone and that sort of thing and he's just a really really great character he's also very funny and very sassy and he's just I think great and I love these books so much. I also love the series after them, but I, you do have to start with Percy Jackson. I love Heroes of Olympus. It's probably my favourite series set in the world, but y- you have to start with, with the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in general, because Harry Potter sort of, like, it's a good series that you can read from middle grade to, like, when you are, like, new adult level. So mm. it really guides you throughout those years. However, of course, you're always tempted because now all of the books are out that you read them back to back, but this is definitely not recommended. <laughs> With Percy yeah. Jackson, however, if you, like, take the the Heroes of Olympus and the Percy Jackson and the Olympians, if you put both of them together, then it's sort of like the same time span, only that you have like, I don't know, 10 books or something and not yeah. only seven. So it's very nice to like sort of read them along each other. And because I have read Percy Jackson when I was an adult, I didn't read it when I was young. So I can also testify that mm-hmm. uh, it still holds up, even though <laughs> when you read it at an old age. Yeah, it's oh, it's it's great. I'm really struggling with not powering through all of them because I kind of want to. I've already overtaken him and finished the first book before he finished the first book on the podcast. So I'm trying to wait until at least he starts the second book before I start the second book. Um, but yes, it's just great. And this, I mean, I've got an entire shelf of just Rick Riordan books because he has written so much in that world. He's also read. He's writing more series in that world now as well. So I'm really excited. I still need to finish Trials of Olympus, which are not Trials, Trials of Olympus. God. The Trials of Apollo. It is early in the morning for me. <laughs> it's not actually that early in the morning. I'm just tired because I've had a long weekend. But uh, Trials of Apollo. The Trials of Apollo series is also a really great but a completely different vibe. Um, and I'm enjoying it as well. That's I true. I actually, I actually finished that series, so I will not go into detail. <laughs> okay, I've only read the first two i need to read the last three i own them all (laughs) they're all on my (laughs) shelf but yes i I mean i finished the magnus chase and they were amazing because they were norse mythology which i i i enjoy norse mythology as well i still think i still think i prefer the greek i mean um yeah yeah, i i think percy jackson just cemented greek mythology in my mind as my favorite um and I, even though I enjoyed the Roman mythology that was explored in Heroes of Olympus, and I did enjoy the Norse mythology for Magnus Chase, I kind of took to like a duck to water with uh, Trials of Apollo because you're straight back in there with Greek mythology, but also I suppose a bit of Roman stuff mixed in. Um, yeah, so all interesting. I think he's doing something in Irish mythology as well, but really? he's doing yeah, he's doing a series a series specifically about Nico. D'Angelo, which I imagine will delve even more into Greek mythology. So, yeah, yeah, it should be should be good. But yes, <laughs> we will start with the first one, and I, I will I won't lie and say it would it would be very upsetting to me if my uh, if my future children did not like Percy Jackson. But I know, of course, it's not to everyone's taste. Although I've yet to recommend it to a single person who hasn't enjoyed it, so <laughs> <laughs> I would be surprised. <laughs> that's so good i mean jordan just said that uh, the books are sitting on her shelf and forever i mean you're listening to a podcast so you're not seeing this but as i am like seeing her right now i also see the big bookshelves behind her and i actually have a question because your little one will arrive soon ish but of course there still will be a time when he is not able to read on his own will you still make room in your bookshelf for children's books and i don't know like put them in the in the lowest row of your bookshelf so that he can actually reach for them I do think that that is a really nice idea. I did want to sort of keep, I suppose, this, the bottom two shelves. I was going to rearrange it because up until now, all of my children's books have actually been quite high up because <laughs> mainly because I've got the illustrated Harry Potters yeah, and okay. they need a tall <laughs> shelf and I'm dictated by the shelf height of my shelves. Um, but and to be fair the illustrated harry potters are a really good i always felt like they were a really good idea even with everything that's gone on with harry potter recently mm-hmm. and having had my feelings about i suppose the author if not the story itself change a little bit um 
I was really sort of conflicted on them. But the illustrated ones, I think, are really amazing because I do think they really turn them into children's books because they are those full illustrated copies. And the the, the, the artist, Jim Kay, is, is really, like, so talented and fantastic. He does such an amazing job. Um, so I think I, I probably will, maybe when they're a bit older, dedicate the lower shelves to books that, that would be suitable for them and probably move some of the more uh, violent fantasy to the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I did think that um, once he started getting his own sort of collection of books, because I'm going to be buying him books. And I mean, of we've course. got a lot of we've got a lot of readers in the family as well who would probably buy him books also especially knowing me, um, I think I'm probably going to put a, a small shelf in his own bedroom so that mm, he can have yeah, his own okay. collection. Um, Ikea do these really lovely kids' shelves where they have them so you can stack them with the spines out like we we grown-ups do. But they also have ones that have a shelf that have a bar at the front so you can have oh, yeah, I've seen those. the covers facing forward, which is actually really nice because a lot of kids' books have such colourful colours and that's what they grab for. So um, having one I mean, where they... you can face them forward is good. Yeah. I, I mean, they can't read what's on the spine. So that's so, yeah. like, that's so intelligent that, that being, they did that. Yeah. That being said, my nephew, he, he can, because they put little characters on the spines. Uh... And if it's a book that he really loves, he recognizes the color of the spine sometimes. So even if he can't read them, he can find what he wants if he wants to. <laughs> he has a particular obsession with Stick Man by Julia Donaldson um, at the moment, which Julia Donaldson wrote The Gruffalo, which is her most uh, famous yeah. one. But Stick Man is her Christmassy book, really. Um, okay. she, I think she's done some other Christmassy ones. Um, and he loves, he loves Stick Man. <laughs> So this is another recommendation, apparently, <laughs> that was it's, not on the list. No, but it's a really good Christmas stocking filler if you know any young kid children. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so third book is Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief, illustrated edition by John Rocco. Cool. So now that we like sneaked in a little tiny mini recommendation in there when talking about the third book what is the fourth one that you have on your list how many do you have on your list by the way I've done I have done five because that is okay. the rule that I give all of my <laughs> other guests I have done five that are the sort of most important ones I have a few honorable mentions but um to be honest I was like it's find it really difficult because I've obviously not given myself the constraint of only being able to go to a desert island or a mystery remote location so I'm, I'm not actually super limited um <laughs> but these are just ones that sort of stood out to me as ones that I really wanted to put on there um so the fourth one is actually a book I've read I've read it but I've not read the rest of the series and my intention was that I wouldn't mind reading the rest of the series um for the first time with alongside my child so it's the the bad beginning by lemony snicket mm -hmm. so a series of unfortunate events yes. is not a series that i ever got into um as a child it was just not one that was bought for me it was not one that i read um i wasn't really into it i read the first book as an adult which was fine i would say i <laughs> I enjoyed it, but I also didn't enjoy it as much as I probably would have when I was younger. Um, just because even though I found it sort of entertaining, I just think it's a very sort of it's a it's a great book to read when you're younger, I think. I've read I watched I read it because I watched the series, the um Netflix adaption uh with Patrick Warburton, who is and uh Neil Patrick Harris um and it was just awesome and the completely best adaption definitely better than the <laughs> than the movie I'm trying to see if maybe someone's listening <laughs> sorry my husband is incredibly partial to the G uh is it Jim Carrey the Jim Carrey movie adaption of a series of unfortunate events I don't <laughs> like I'm not a big fan of Jim Carrey. So, <laughs> so, so were, were you expecting him to like crash through the door and be like, no, don't listen to her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yes, just register as a dis is his disagreement with my opinion. Um, it is Jim Jim Carrey. Yeah, it's Jim Jim Carrey is um, it's the right actor. Sorry, my brain's like a colander at the moment, so it's sort of just I can't. Nothing sounds right. It doesn't matter what I say. <laughs> Uh, but I really, really enjoyed the TV show and I wanted to read the book. And I was actually kind of impressed to read the book and find how close the TV show adaption was. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why I really wanted to read, I suppose, the series of unfortunate events, probably when child, probably not a very small child, but when they were maybe a lot younger than I was when I, when I read it, um, is just because I think it's a really excellent book for improving English skills, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And also vocabulary and the three kids in it are very active learners and they take great pride in the fact that they're learners and that they're intelligent and they like science and they like, you know, English and maths and they really enjoy these things. And I just think those those aren't bad messages to give to literally any child. <laughs> um, and they're very sort of, they've got a can-do attitude no matter what happens to them, you know, they fix the problem and they get on with it and it's even though you know what everything that happens to them absolutely constitutes is like child abuse um it's and it's evil um it's just um i think a really valuable series of books i um because they obviously they have a lot of the definitions of okay so they use a word and maybe it's a word that a young person might not have come across so they give you the definition and examples of how you might use it and i i mean useless to me at the age of 22 because I knew all of those words but I imagine really really valuable to like an 11 year old <laughs> who hasn't so yeah I would like to read the whole series but I put the bad beginning because obviously it's the first one um, and, and I have read the first one and I do think it's a it's a good but although it, it can be quite scary yeah I mean <laughs> what what my mom because because now you said that you would not mind to experience this series along mm. with your child. I remember when my mother and I experienced Harry Potter alongside each other, she used to always read ahead in the chapters and to see whether it was like Mariah <laughs> proof, so to say, yeah. and not too scary. Yeah. Depending on this, I, I remember, for example, in the fourth book, she was skipping like the first, like the prologue part. Yeah, yeah that know, is pretty, like, that's pretty dark. Yeah. That's, that's when yeah. you start, it starts getting quite dark. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So she, for example, skipped that. And I, I think that was one of the only things in the book that she ever really skipped because mm -hmm. she was like, okay, like it's something different if the book sort of builds up and you have the anticipation that something bad might happen mm -hmm. at the end versus first chapter. <laughs> Someone Dive dies. <laughs> here is a, and, here is the articulate description of someone's murder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's yeah, yeah. That to be fair, that is quite a scary bit. I um, I actually when I was going back over my Goodreads, I have put like estimates as to years when I read specific books, and I did find it really interesting to look back on my reading and try and marry it up with the age I was, and did think I was like. I feel like someone should have been paying closer attention to what I was reading because I don't know that I would want, you know, an eight-year-old to be reading this book. <laughs> um, and, and whereas other ones, I, I don't know, it's just, it's quite funny. But it's nice that she did that. Also, she probably wanted to know what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, this... Of, of course, like she she wanted to know mm. what happens, but especially when you have a younger child, I think mm. it's so good, like just to like, you know, read ahead a couple of chapters, however much time you think you will have with your child, because yeah, yeah especially if you say that uh, these books like are a little darker or have like some questionable topics towards yeah. children. I mean, I also, I also never read it, but I have heard from a YouTuber from America who really like loved the series growing up. So I know in general what the story is about, but of course you always need to see what is right for the child at that, that point in life. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, we have, <laughs> I've had a guest on the podcast who's a YouTuber from America, uh, Rachel from Let Me in the Library, absolutely swear by, swears by the series of Unfortunate Books. So I'm sure she's going to be very happy to hear that they have made it onto the list. <laughs> 
list. They're also one of the few children's books where you can actually still get the like the full hardback sets that actually look really nice on the shelf, like the full hardback oh. series of unfortunate events. There's 13 books altogether. They're all fairly mm-hmm. short. Yeah. Um, but they've got different colored spines and they're actually kind of they're quite they're quite a nice set really. So yeah, <laughs> it's every just... book collector Ah. Of course, it's got to, it's got to look like. I mean, I, to be fair, I actually really love that. When you go into the children's section of Waterstones here in the UK, they always decorate it so amazing, and all the books are also colourful, which isn't always the case in the adult section. The adult section is always a bit more boring and yeah. writingy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I I went with the bad beginning because it's not a book series that I've got a strong. I suppose connection to myself but I know a lot of people who have and it might be nice to be able to experience a book for the first time with my child because I, I I've read a lot of I mean I've not read more books than most people but I've read like a fair few and I feel like it might get irritating after a while <laughs> <laughs> for, for me to already know what happens on all of them and uh, for my child to never be in the know and I can imagine that being quite frustrated from their perspective <laughs> so there is that <laughs> oh that's so true but it's so great that you have a book like that also in the list where you don't know everything that is going to happen up front so what is the final book on the list that actually made it on the list? And afterwards, we can talk about some of the honorable mentions. <laughs> Okie doke. So this one's a bit of a random choice in comparison to the others, because the others are all actually sort of designed to be children's books. Um, whereas this is not a children's book, and I would probably have to wait. I looked online to see when it was recommended at what age parents and children thought that uh, this was a book of interest and apparently age 11 seems to be the recommendation because there is all of i mean there's one swear word in it and there's <gasps> some slight um jokes that allude to uh rude or inappropriate behavior uh, but it's nothing <laughs> massively overt so i suppose you could probably skip over it pretty easily if you wanted to <laughs> but it's the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy by douglas <sighs> adams i That's so it. i it's been <laughs> it's been a while since i've read it um so i actually what i i did feel like i needed to research to make sure that the content was all fine because i didn't remember anything inappropriate but I was like mm, I'm gonna check just in case uh, which is where I got my sort of flags um for it but um I just love I love this series I'm I've started uh, progressing through the rest of them this is the first one and I just think it's full of funny quotes and funny moments and it's a great introduction to sci-fi which is a, se- a genre that I really enjoy and I would like to share it is a book that i would consider you know a boy friendly reading book it's not it's not too girly it's got you know lots of interesting actiony bits and that sort of thing and the whole series is a bit like that so um and it also has a lot of really for something so random and bizarre every now and then it'll say something really insightful or really thoughtful or something that might give you a slightly different perspective on something that you'd never thought about and I find that really interesting and I like Douglas Adams's writing so I just thought yeah that would be a good one to recommend a bit later on as as a series and they're also again not very long and if you wanted to listen to the audiobooks they're narrated by Martin Freeman which are excellent as well so there's lots (laughs) of I can imagine (laughs) Cool. So I think from book one to book five, we have so- sort of like started to climb up the age ladder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, great. So before we go into the recap of the books, what were the ones that did not quite make the cut? <laughs> okay. So there's a few more younger children's books. There's We're Going on a Bear Hunt by Michael Rosen and Helen Oxenbury. Um, it may be Aww. one. I don't know if it's one that uh, you're familiar with over in Germany, At least not it, me. Is, <laughs> it is um yeah the winner of the 1989 nestle smarties book prize so it is an older book it's uh i think i assume published in 1989 if that's when it won the won the award but it is still massively in print it's still massively popular it's got all these gorgeous sort of watercolor illustrations oh. um this is a a paperback copy that i have i think because 
<laughs> I just do really love it. It was my favorite growing up. And it was also one of my husband's favorites growing up. It's literally about a family that go on a bear hunt. That's the end of the story. <laughs> it, it rhymes. It's got repetition in it. Um, I bought a copy of it for my younger brother when he was quite young. And now I don't need to read it to him because if I start reading it to him, he will shout the words back at me <laughs> without looking at the books because he knows every <laughs> single word to the book. <laughs> um so yeah, it's just about we're going on a bear hunt and then the obstacles they face along the way. It's pretty straightforward. These parents really should have um, maybe looked into the health and safety of <laughs> three small children on a bear hunt um, beforehand, but all all good. Uh, the second one is another Roald Dahl book. It's Roald Dahl Revolting Rhymes. Mm-hmm. Again, one that I think also isn't as popular as his other ones. I, I guess I'm just not that into his other books um but it's it retells classic nursery rhymes and stories so cinderella jack and the beanstalk snow white and the seven dwarves goldilocks and the three bears little red riding hood and the wolf and three little pigs and he does them all as poems uh but he rewrites them in his usual wacky way there's words like knickers in there that you know kids find hilarious um and they're kind of told with a twist so like Red Riding Hood ends up making the wolf into a fur coat and that sort of thing. Like it kind of turns all of these classic fairy tales on the head. The people you think are the good guys are sometimes the bad guys and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, so Revolting Rhymes, it's his sort of less less Disney-like takes on the on the classics. And I remembered it. I had to learn one of the poems all the way through. Um, ah. for I think it was a primary school or high school um, because we had to perform it as part of class so I did the Little Red Riding one because it's <laughs> the shortest one um, but it's great and they rhyme and they're a lot of fun so I've got that one um, oh, dropping things I've got A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness ah okay yeah um, that's another one that one has heard but not when I was a child but you know, when I was a grown up. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a newer book. Patrick Ness is an author I've heard loads about, but not one that I know a lot about. This book did make me cry. Um, I'm always quite shocked by the fact that it is really considered something that is aimed for younger people. Um, it deals with really heavy subject matter, though, so it'd probably mm. be a judgment call as to whether I would want to recommend it to specific children, not even just mine, any children, um, because it does ultimately deal with a little boy coping with his mother's terminal cancer diagnosis um but it's a gorgeous book with all black and white illustrations it's got fables in it which are really nice there's a lot of really interesting moral conundrums and stories in it and I I remember it made a quite an impression and I thought it was a very important children's book when I read it again as an adult <laughs> um there's the Gruffalo by Julia Donaldson it's just a one kids that really like it, it did it wasn't out when i was little so i don't have any emotional connection to it whatsoever i have read it it's very clever um i like i like how they do it um i like how uh, the story progresses i like the mouse he's kind of sassy he's great um but again i it's it's just one that kids really seem to love and i think maybe you have to be a kid to understand that but they they do <laughs> um and it is one that i buy i sort of have a set of um board books so you know the ones with the hard pages so that children can't rip them when <laughs> anyone i know is having a baby when we have a new niece or nephew on the way um everybody else buys them clothes and toiletries and that sort of thing because speaking as someone who you know is having a baby soon people get you you get inundated with clothes and toiletries <laughs> and blankets which are all lovely but no one buys you books <laughs> so um I always buy books for new babies they're usually things like we're going on a bear hunt the gruffalo where's spot you know those regular ones um the classics that I remember very hungry caterpillar as well um <laughs> but <laughs> yeah so the gruffalo is one that nearly sort of made it on there but because I don't have a personal connection to it myself I I have read it it was not one that kind of made it and then yeah I think <sighs> The others are just tend to, they're kind of older books that um, they are my attempts at doing boys recommendations because I, I'm, I tend to recommend 
books that probably are marketed more towards girls there's no reason boys can't enjoy reading them but because I know more girls that read um (laughs) that tends to be (laughs) my area um one of which is The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien Mm. because that's a really lovely book it's lighter than Lord of the Rings so (laughs) yeah it's easier to recommend to young people probably teenagers but you know yeah still (laughs) one one for later on and um i think a book series that i would definitely have to recommend would be the cirque de freak series by darren shan Mm -hmm. not because i really like it but because it was the only book series my husband read when he was younger he is very fond of it um (laughs) so yes uh, i think cirque de freak would probably make it in there and weirdly a book called wizards and robots which is about exactly what it sounds like it's about (laughs) wizards and robots um it is written by will i am really (laughs) yeah (laughs) this is so random (laughs) yeah it is written by brian david johnson and will i am as in will i am from the black eyed peas for anybody who was thinking will i am isn't he that guy yes the guy from the black eyed peas um i don't I don't know whether it's just because he is like he is a rapper, he's a music artist by trade. I don't and I'm not saying that there's any like that it's a very skillful job. He's incredibly talented at music production and all the other things that he did. I just did not know he read bo- wrote books. I just <laughs> I did not know he wrote books. So when I saw it on a shelf, I was like that's never the will I am. Why? <laughs> and when I went into it, I didn't know. I think I read it purely because I was like, I don't know what this is. It's called Wizards and Robots. I don't, I don't know what I'm getting. But it's actually so clever. <laughs> it's got a female protagonist who is into science and engineering. It's got other characters. It's got some other kid characters that are all really clever. Um, it's a very STEM book. Uh, it's got wizards. It's got robots. It's got action. It's actually really well written, I think, and it's a fun read for young people. So I was like, yeah, that'll probably end up making it. It's very shiny as well. It's got a very shiny rainbow cover in the hardback version. <laughs> so, yeah, that and I think that's probably the I think that's the last one. Yes, I think that's the last one. I to be honest, I probably would recommend any number of these. I will undoubtedly try and get my child to read classic novels at some point in their life whether I'll be successful we will see um (laughs) but (laughs) until then um yeah I wanted to sort of uh, stick with those books because I just felt like they're all they're all I think they're all good books with lessons to teach and all that sort of thing but yes (laughs) that's true so to wrap up we've got five books we have and uh, I have taken notes while we were (laughs) talking so now you can see whether I was actually listening correctly (laughs) so we have the giraffe the pelly and me by Roald Dahl which is about these several animals who have a window cleaning company and where you really see the writing style and also like a little guest appearance of a Willy Wonka in the book so you really see how the Roald Dahl books interconnect we've got uh, Kenzuki's Kingdom is it did I write that down correctly okay <laughs> by Michael Moporgo where you have a little child that accidentally while he was traveling with his parents on a boat gets cast away to like an an island he's stranded on the island and then may meets a guy called kinsuki and it explores all different sorts of lessons ab- around racism and also like there are also some like more adult topics but they are talked through a very like child friendly lens so to say then of course you have uh, percy jackson the first book in the illustrated edition by rick riordan which uh, i I mean what can i say about percy jackson everything has been said so i will just leave it at that (laughs) and then we have the bad beginning which is the first book in the series of unfortunate events series by lemony snicket where we follow these different children and it is a nice series if you want to let your children know that being someone who wants to acquire knowledge of whatever field is nothing bad, but actually something that uh, comes out as a very positive trade within the main characters of those books and how it can also help you to get out of a tight situation. 
<laughs> which is what these uh, three poor children are mainly thrown into <laughs> tight situations. <laughs> and then the last one was one that is more recommended for like an older audience, depending on how far you think your child actually really is with reading something like that on their own. And that's, that is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, which is, of course, a classic, but not really marketed towards children. So, yeah, depends on your parenting style when you want to recommend this. And yeah, I think that's that's been all. And, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to, to the Galaxy is a great introduction into sci-fi, which is, of course, something that is not too heavily explored in children's literature like there it is very fantasy heavy but the sci-fi element does not come through too much so uh, you need to work with what you can get so, yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely I think I yeah sci- I mean sci-fi's got a lot of different sort of sub-genres as well I think doesn't it I think especially Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy I like that kind of sci-fi I like wacky sci-fi that just is completely random and all over the place just it's just in space essentially <laughs> um but yeah that's uh that is all five of them and you did a much better job than me in terms of keeping track because i um i'm really bad at sort of trans so this is a secret for anybody who listens to the podcast um i write down all of the books that people choose but um if someone were to go through my notes uh to look at how i have spelt either the names of the books or the authors of the books <laughs> um they would not be able to find the same books that <laughs> that I managed to find sometimes if I'm not entirely sure uh, because I um hadn't realized until the pandemic how much I rely on lip reading mm. to um, understand what people say uh, I really didn't I had no idea that that was something that I did um so converting to zoom calls when sometimes it doesn't always marry up with the the sounds or maybe sometimes the person isn't always looking at you when they're seen when I've only got the sort of sounds of the words they just don't go into my brain the same way so I end up having to write them like phonetically (laughs) and if I don't do a very good job of that I have to write notes on the actual um plot of the book that I kind of get from the so I, I can research it and then eventually find it and then I'm always really pleased when I do I've never had any close calls where I've actually had to go back to a guest and ask so <laughs> that's really fun I always feel really awful because I feel like it's a, a complete indictment of my listening skills but it is it's something I've genuinely tried so hard to get better at and I just if if I don't have both, I just really, really, really struggle. Um, it frustrates my husband all the time because if he says something while he's not looking at me or I'm not looking at him, um, and I'll just, I'll hear the noise, I'll hear the sound, I'll know that he's talking to me. Um, and because I've tried to cover it up for so long, I kind of just, um, I agree. My immediate response is to agree and then my brain will catch up and put the pieces together of what I've said and then sometimes I don't I I didn't mean to agree and I have to backtrack and <laughs> and give my actual response but um yeah slight, slightly frustrating sometimes but you did an amazing job of getting, <laughs> getting them all right and the authors as well <laughs> the, the thing is if someone were to look at my notes like the best example is the giraffe and the pelly and me because I was just writing down what I heard from you but my mm-hmm. mind was not registering because I I did not see the cover yet. I did not yeah. know what the pally is, but I didn't want to expose yeah. myself. And then, of course, like through you talking, I realized, ah, it's a pelican. But yes. because I, you know, as a non-native speaker of English, do not use the short form pally. It's so so I never yeah. really thought about it. To be fair, it. I probably should have thought to explain that because we don't generally <laughs> call pelicans pellies. I think Roald Dahl has used that one for the number of syllables to make Uh. the the title (laughs) flow and to help with the rhymes inside um I because I've never referred to it as a pelly but I can see that it's a pelican on the front of (laughs) on the front of the book (laughs) so yeah I (laughs) probably should have explained that (laughs) but yes uh (laughs) yeah amazing but yeah thank you so much for your time and for hosting my little podcast it's been amazing as ever um if listeners wanted to find you 
and your book recommendations and your hosting your fabulous fabulous hosting skills where could they find you <laughs> thank you so much so my podcast is called child of the library and you can find me on spotify on apple podcasts and also on deezer if for whatever reason you are using Deezer and not one of the other two. <laughs> and of course, I also have an Instagram channel, which is at child of the library or just in one word. Excellent. And if you want to hear, uh, hear more of the podcast, subscribe, follow us on social media. We are in all the same places, Marika and child of the library. We are, uh, so yeah, most places, if you just give it a search and we're at books to last pod on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, so so thank you so much, Jordan, for sharing your list. And also, you listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, bye for now. Bye. Thank you all for listening to that special Christmas episode of the Books to Last podcast. Thank you to Marika for playing host. She did an amazing job. I hope you all enjoyed it. I know it was a little bit different. As I mentioned on a previous episode, I am now on sort of podcast maternity leave. So I will be back sometime in the new year with new episodes for you all. I've got lots of exciting guests in mind. And yeah, I can't wait to uh, get back to it. But um, in the meantime, you could go back and listen to the archive of episodes. You could check out some of the wonderful podcasts and YouTube channels of guests of the podcast. Um, you could even read some of the books recommended. I might try and do that, maybe. <laughs> but um, whatever you do, I hope you have a really lovely holiday period, lovely new year. And hopefully I will be speaking to you in the not too distant future. Bye for now.